Good morning, church. The Gospel of Mark, beginning in chapter 1. We read these words. We will read. You might have to help me out, guys. <laughs> there we go. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And at that time, Jesus came up from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And at that time, Jesus, excuse me, descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. After Jesus, excuse me, after John was put into prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother, uh, his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. And at once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. And so begins the Gospel of Mark, as well as a series of lessons this winter that will come from this book. We'll be looking at the life of Jesus as told by Mark, which of the four Gospels, I think probably gets the least attention. It's the shortest of the four Gospels, was very likely the first of them to be written. It isn't as eloquently written as the others, tends to be direct and to the point. In fact, we see that right at the beginning. Deciding how to begin a story is a very difficult decision for an author or a storyteller. You, you have to begin with a compelling hook, an introduction that draws people's attentions and gets them to keep reading. One of the most famous introductions in literature is from Charles Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities, which begins, it was the best of times, and it was the worst of times. As a preacher, I spend a lot of time uh, during the week working on my introduction, deciding on what story or, or uh, to begin with that can transition into our text for the day. But as you may have noticed today, I, I didn't do that. I just started with the text itself, because that's how Mark begins. 
He just jumps right into the story. Now compare that with the other three Gospels. Now all four Gospels had this mighty task. How do you begin to tell the story of Jesus Christ? Well, Matthew and Luke, they fittingly decide to start with his birth and the incarnation. Matthew begins in this seemingly very boring way by jumping right into Jesus' genealogy. Uh, but that's only boring through Western eyes. And for the Jewish audience that Matthew is writing to, all of these names are stories in and of themselves, which they immediately recognized, and which we don't have time to get in today. But Luke, he starts uh, by beginning, by briefly explaining why he was writing this down when it had already been written before, which is that so you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. And then Luke starts, he backs up a bit before Jesus' birth and begins with the birth of John the Baptist being foretold. And then as we know, we've got the, the Gospel of John, this poetic beginning, which begins even before all of that, beginning with the beginning of creation, echoing those opening lines of Genesis, in the beginning was the Word. The Word became flesh. Now we've spent a lot of the last month or so talking about the birth of Jesus as it relates to the season of Advent and Christmas and, and the significance of the incarnation and how Jesus was, was God, but he came to earth in the form of a baby born in a manger to, to a poor peasant couple. But in him was Emmanuel, God with us. And, and all of that theologically rich, beautiful story, for some reason, Mark decides it's skippable. He just, uh, uh, my kids have grown up watching shows on Netflix and, and other streaming services. They don't know what live TV is. Um, it often gives them the option to skip the intro. And that's usually the, the theme song or the opening credits. But what if it skipped the first couple of episodes and dumped you right in the third episode of the season? That, that's kind of what Mark does here. That Jesus that Mark introduces us to us, he's already a grown man. But if you're paying attention, Mark makes it very clear right from the beginning that this is no ordinary human the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Mark begins by telling us what so many in the story that he's about to tell failed to understand. That Jesus was the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one of God, the long-awaited Savior and deliverer of God's people. This story he is telling is good news. But it begins in an unexpected way. See, even if Mark skips past Bethlehem and Nazareth, he still conveys the surprising beginning of the Messiah's mission, which didn't begin in Jerusalem, didn't begin in Rome. And for people who expected the Messiah to be a political or military ruler that would overthrow the Roman occupiers, reestablish an earthly throne in Jerusalem, it is very unusual that even Mark's story begins where it does, the Judean wilderness. And with this man wearing camel's hair, eating bugs and honey, and people were flocking to him. They would journey hours from their villages and cities to find John and hear this message that he is proclaiming about repenting for the forgiveness of sins. Crowds of people wand, waded into the Jordan River and were baptized by him. But even as he did, John the Baptist was telling them that someone was coming that was more 
powerful than him, the straps of whose sandals they, he was not worthy to untie, and who would baptize not with water, but with the Holy Spirit of God. And one day, in that crowd of people, standing in line with all the rest of them, was Jesus of Nazareth. And like all the other countless people standing around him, Jesus came to be baptized by John in the Jordan. But when he did, something different happened. Something amazing. The Holy Spirit descended upon the Son of God, and he heard that voice from heaven, God the Father reminding him that he loved him. And Jesus was going to need that reminder because he was at the beginning of a very difficult journey. And so began the mission and ministry of Jesus the Messiah. And yet in another unexpected turn, the Holy Spirit immediately led Jesus not to Jerusalem, not to Rome, but even further into the wilderness where he was tempted by Satan for 40 days, surrounded by wild animals, but was attended to by angels. All the while, Jesus remembered the words that he had heard above the Jordan River. You are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. John was arrested. Jesus eventually returned to civilization. This time, proclaiming good news. Which John had been preparing the people to hear. And Jesus said to them, the time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. The rest of the passage which we read earlier talks about the very first people who did exactly that. Not anyone of particular note, not the educated elites or powerful rulers, but but simple fishermen. They dropped their nets when called by Jesus and heeded his instructions, Come, follow me. This is the beginning of Mark's story, which compared to the other Gospels is seemingly abridged, maybe even rushed. But this story... And the way that Mark chooses to tell it is clear and explicit that this is the story of the servant king. The gospel of Mark is going to be leading us through the next several weeks and months all the way up to Good Friday and the path to the cross and then to Easter in Christ's resurrection. And this is a story unlike any other ever told. For this is not a king like any other known before or ever will be. Because his kingdom is not of this earth. It is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of God. And because of this, it is a kingdom radically different than any other that we know. And so in the eyes of the kingdoms of this world... It would appear to be backwards or or even upside down. But in reality, it is very much right side up. For it is ruled by the almighty creator of this world. And this is the paradox that so many struggled with then and continue to do so today. Later, as we'll see in Mark chapter 10, Jesus lays it out in a very plain language. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. What kind of king becomes a servant? What kind of deity becomes a human and a a poor and lowly one at that? 
This is so audacious, so astounding, that it can only be a true story because this is not the kind of story that humans can make up. It, it doesn't make sense. But Mark makes it clear right from the beginning that this is a true story and that it is good news and that it is good news for us. God came not for us to serve Him, but God came to serve us. God came to give His life as a ransom for us all. This story of the servant king is one that many of us are familiar with. We've heard this story before, but which we must continue to remember and to rehear and to retell. Because if it ever stops becoming surprising to us, we need to be jolted and shaken. And I pray that our study in Mark this winter helps us to do so for the good news no matter if it's old news, must always be shocking and surprising. And sometimes it is uncomfortable. But it is good news for everyone. The kingdom of God has come near to us all. And because of this, our lives are not the same. Our Lives proclaim the good news. For the gospel is a call to action. Good news always changes you, especially when it is the best news. I've known people who, when learning the good news that they were going to be a father or a mother, made abrupt changes in their lives in response to that good news. They stopped smoking, they stopped drinking. They made changes in their work or living situations. Or they had suddenly had this new way of looking at the world. When people hear the good news that the cancer is completely in remission, they live differently, often with a new lease on life. And that change in behavior is what is meant by the word repentance. Now, we often associate that word with guilt, as in repent or face the consequences. But it's more associated with grace and good news. Your world has been changed by God. You are part of a better kingdom now, God's kingdom Change your life to keep up with the changes that God has made to your world. The good news. It's transformative. And it requires a change in our lives. Because it's just that good of news. That's the only way to respond to it. Because, and that's exactly what Jesus' first disciples did. They dropped everything and followed him because how else can you respond but with repentance they believed the good news which continues to be heard and believed today for this is the gospel we are preaching The good news that we are proclaiming, not just with our words, but with our lives. The kingdom of God is not just near, it is here in this room. It is present in our community. Just as the Spirit entered Jesus when He was baptized, so too do we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For just as John proclaimed, Christ baptizes us not just with water, but with the Holy Spirit. It cleanses us of our sins, washing us clean, not just once, but continually works in cleansing us and transforming us into the likeness of Christ. And if you would like to receive this precious gift, you can repent and believe and be baptized today. 
We have a couple people who have been considering baptism and are planning on it very soon. And you can join them too. We would love to see that and rejoice in that. And in all things, may God receive all glory and honor and praise. Amen.